Awesome. Good morning. So if you come here before, we rock with drums and guitars, and sometimes we do a cappella with nothing, and sometimes piano, and it's super fun, and God loves it all. So this morning, let's stand, let's worship, let's pray. God, thank you so much for today. I thank you that we can just come into your house of worship just to lift up your name um, and connect with you personally this morning. We just love you in your precious holy name. Amen.
Good morning, church. A little housekeeping here before we get going. If I were taller, this wouldn't be a problem. <laughs> and if I didn't wander so much. Oh, there's probably a sermon illustration in that somewhere. Well, good morning. Let's, uh, let's approach the throne of grace in prayer. Lord, thank you for the freedom to worship. Uh, thank you for the blessing of, of bringing us together and being able to freely give you the praise, the glory, and the honor that you deserve. Lord, we ask that your spirit fill these walls in a special way today. Be with us. Let us hear your word. Uh, let us be moved by who you are and what you've done for us. We pray that you are exalted through everything that we do today. And we pray these things in Jesus' holy and perfect name. Amen. And now I have to get my computer booted up because I didn't do that first. It's booted. It just needs to... Ah, there we go. Well, we're continuing our sermon series on burning questions. And today's burning question comes from Jesus. He says, what do you want me to do for you? For centuries now, mankind has been longing for more. More and more. It began back in the Garden of Eden when Satan took the form of a serpent and he tempted Adam and Eve to eat from the tree of knowledge of good, of good and evil because he said, no, you won't die and be like God, enticing them to become more than what they were as God's perfect creation. And so Adam and Eve ate from the tree and sin entered the world. And now, because of their actions, mankind's nature has been forever changed. To want more and more. To be selfish. And then we see it playing out in the, in the biblical historical narratives. Cain killing his brother Abel because his offering was not as good as Abel's. And so he strikes him down. We see Lot and Abraham having this, this conflict because Lot thinks he needs more land for his, his side of the, of the business, of the family. And so he leaves Abraham behind and in turn loses his wife and his land and all of that. We see it in Joseph's brothers where Joseph is the favorite son and so the brothers are jealous because they want that status. They want to be dad's favorite. And on and on and on I could recount uh, countless stories in scripture about the nature of mankind. But it doesn't stop just because God stopped writing Bible verses. It continues on. We see this nature in our culture today. Every single day we see this. Listen to these news headlines from this week. Ex-congressman accused of ballot stuffing, bribery, and obstruction. What motivates someone to do that? A mayor's home is vandalized just before she votes no on defunding the police. Portland mayor is tear gassed after speaking with protesters. And finally, federal agents' use of force at protests faces internal U.S. government probes. All of those are driven by mankind's selfish nature. And while I did see a few positive and uplifting uh, headlines, I think you get the point. Because sin has entered this world, our nature has been to want more and more control over everything. That's because we are selfish people. God knows this. In fact, he tells us why things are the way they are. In James chapter 4, James chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, he says this. He says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. 
I bring this up, this nature of selfishness that we all suffer from, because I want this selfishness idea to be in the back of your mind as we tackle today's burning question. Jesus asks, what do you want me to do for you? Now, we could take this anyway. We literally could take that question. What do we want Jesus to do for us? Oh, my goodness. The list starts here. and Well, it's going to be a long list, isn't it? But as with any scripture, we have to put it into its context and take a look at why he asks this question and who's he asking it to. So turn with me to Luke chapter 18, please. And we're actually going to back up to verse 18 and see why Jesus asks. You can also click on your phone or something like that if you have one of those, if you don't have a paper Bible. I just I like this. It feels good in my hands. You know, I could have preached almost the exact same sermon that I preached two weeks ago, talking about our spiritual blindness, and it would have been okay, but I chose to go a different route. But that's also part of the context here, as you'll see. If you want to hear that, Go back and online and listen to that sermon from a couple weeks ago talking about spiritual blindness because it is a big factor in the context of this sermon today, of this passage today. But here we are, Luke 18, verse 18. A ruler questioned Jesus, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he had heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. Peter said, behold, we have left our own homes and followed you. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come eternal life. Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and all the things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon. And after they have scourged him, they will kill him. And the third day he will rise again. But the disciples understood none of these things. And the meaning of the statement was hidden from them. And they did not comprehend the things that were said. As Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now hearing a crowd go by, he began to inquire what this was. They told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he called out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, he questioned him, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. So read the words of the living God. (coughs) Excuse me. I want to ask you this question. What do people want Jesus to be? Let me add this to that. What do people want Jesus to be, but what isn't he? If Christianity were a religion created by man, it would look far, far different. And we see that because we see false gospels all over the world. Today I'm going to take a look at just three of these false gospels because there are hundreds of perversions of the gospel of Christ. 
But I want to look at three of those, and then I'm going to give you the contrasting view of what Christianity really is, according to Scripture. The first one I want to take a look at is called the Grace Movement. The Grace Movement, uh, it claims that God's grace covers all of our sin. You might be thinking, well, yes, it does. And it does. It covers all of our sin. Hebrews 8.12 says, For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And on the surface, this grace movement sounds fantastic, doesn't it? Oh, my sins are forgiven. But what the grace movement really does, it gives the false impression that because my sin is covered by God's grace, I can go and live whatever type of life I want to, a life full of sin and earthly pleasures, and God's going to forgive me anyway. But if you read in Scripture, 1 John 1, 1, 6 says, if we say that we have fellowship with him, in other words, if we put our faith in Christ, and yet we walk in the darkness, yet we walk in sin, we live a life full of sin, we lie, and we do not practice the truth. But doesn't that sound so good, that grace movement? Man, you mean... I can have all the pleasures of the earth and of the world, and all I have to do is say, oh, yeah, I'm good, because God's grace covers me. It sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? This grace movement, it's a selfish doctrine created by selfish people as a loophole for them to live a life full of sin. And it sounds too good to be true, because it is too good to be true. The truth is, God's grace does extend to all believers. But those who willingly live a sinful, habitual life, they have proven that they're not true believers. Hebrews 3, 13 through 14 say, Encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. Brothers and sisters, we cannot live a life full of willing sin. Does that mean we're going to be perfect? No. No, it doesn't. We will still stumble. We will still fall. Sanctification is an ongoing process. But if we willingly go back to that addiction or that habit, that sin, we are proving, as the Bible tells us, that we are not really a follower of Jesus Christ. Prove your faith genuine by not falling victim to this deceitful false gospel and prove it genuine by seeking the will of Christ and trying to carry that out until the end. Second one I want to take a look at is universalism. Universalism is, is a little easier to see. Their big claim is that there is no hell and that all souls will be saved in the end. Anyone who spent time reading scripture knows that Jesus spent more time talking about hell than he did about heaven. He wanted to warn people that this place is real. And this is what happens to those who don't follow him. He says that it's a place of eternal torment, of unquenchable fire, where the worm does not die, where people will gnash their teeth in anguish and regret. Have you ever gnashed your teeth? Can you? To do that for all eternity? Ugh. That's like 10 seconds and I'm already getting a headache. I don't want to spend eternity doing that. He says there's, this is a place from which there's no return even to warn your loved ones. That's why it's so important that we spread the gospel now, today. He calls it a place of outer darkness. This one's a little easier to see, as I said. But what are the implications? If all souls go to heaven then you're free to live however you want. There's no penalty for your sin. Universalism is, is an outright contradiction to the gospel of Christ. We, we read in Scripture that God is a just God who must hold people accountable for their sin. And if he doesn't punish sinners, then why would Jesus have had to die on the cross? Why would Jesus have had to take the punishment that we deserve for our sin so that we can be righteous? He wouldn't have had to. And now there's a whole other set of issues with God that we would have to deal with. Universalism at its core is just another excuse to live however you want, doing whatever you want, because it's a man-created religion, a man-created gospel, 
in a man-created God. The last one I want to talk about is the prosperity gospel. Also known as the name claim it. My personal favorite, the blab it and grab it. The health and wealth. And it's been referred to as the positive confession theology. At its core, this teaches that God wants believers to be physically healthy, materially wealthy, and personally happy. Well, that sounds great. And he does want us to find joy. That's not what I'm not saying. I'm not saying he doesn't want us to be joyful in Christ. But they say that if you pray hard enough for something, you're going to get it. Oh, God, just let this be the winning lottery ticket. I'm going to spend the next four days until Wednesday night's drawing praying that the ticket that I bought at the gas station today is the winning ticket. Oh, God, please let it be that. So... I didn't go buy a lottery ticket today. I'm just using that as an illustration. But man, that's a pretty hard prayer, isn't it? How about if I pray for my, for my child who has an ailment? Lord, heal my child from, from this genetic disorder. Oh, please, God, make him normal. Make her normal. Please fix my child. What happens when he does it? Because that's not part of his will. Or the pastor will tell them, nah, I shouldn't even call them pastors. The, the speaker will tell them, just give $100 to the church and God's going to return it back into your, your wallet 100 times more than that, 10 times more than that, 1,000 times more than that. And so you give and you give and you give to the church and you get nothing in return. How awful does Christianity look under this perversion? They make God out to be some cosmic vending machine who caters to your every need, your every want, your every desire. And that's what the prosperity gospel does to Jesus. It says, just ask. Oh, he's going to give it no matter what. But this is a direct contradiction of Scripture. We read about it in James 1.3. You ask and do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Now, should we submit our requests to God? Absolutely, 100%. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. He wants you to talk to Him. He wants you to be in conversation with, with Him. He wants to provide for you. He wants to give you what is good for you. And should we expect God to answer these prayers? Absolutely. John 15, 7 through 8 says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. God is glorified when he answers prayers. And that's why we exist, is to bring him glory. And so yes, ask him. He wants to provide for you. You. But don't forget that we have to ask with a motive that is in line with the will of God. The challenge is the challenge for us is determining which of our prayers are selfish and which ones aren't selfish. That's hard. That can be tricky. Because we might be praying with the best of intentions. Oh God, I I want this to to be good for your kingdom. But maybe we're missing the mark. And that happens. We had a a situation yesterday where we had dinner at Mexico Lindo with Melanie and Cliff here. Welcome to uh, Sermon Pastoral Family here. We get to use you as sermon illustrations. Uh, So we had dinner, and then I had just come from the baseball game, so I had my pickup. Heather had the expedition. So we leave and I go home and, and my wife calls Sophie, who is out the house, and says, hey, the expedition won't start. It's, and I'm stuck at the restaurant. She says, okay, I'll be there. I grab my jumper cables out of the garage and I drive over there and I go and I turn the key over and it goes, it's like, huh, that doesn't sound good. 
you're right, honey, it won't start. And so I, I look around, I pull out my phone, do a little troubleshooting, and I say, wow, I don't think it's the ignition coil, I don't think it's the spark plugs. I'm guessing it's the fuel pump. I'm not a mechanic, I'm not even gonna pretend to be a mechanic, especially when you get all those electronics in there. No thank you, that's above my pay grade. But I, so I call Cliff, and I say, Cliff, do you have a tow rope? I need to tow the expedition to a mechanic. Well, actually, Heather called him, but you get the point, right? So Cliff shows up with the tow rope, and he goes, and I say, I think it's the fuel pump. And he goes, well, did you try the uh, fuel reset switch? And I'm like, you're messing with me, right? I was like, yeah, did you check your blinker fluid? And I said, and, and he goes, no, no, that's a real thing. And I'm like, uh-huh. I'm going to look it up, but I'm skeptical. So I pulled my phone, sure enough, he was right, he's a smart guy. And so I look up on the expedition, where is it at? And, and I go into the back, but before Cliff gets there, before Cliff got there, Elsie goes, Dad, you should pray. Because I'm thinking in my mind, how am I going to pay for a mechanics bill right now? I don't, I don't have a budget set aside for a broken down vehicle right now, and, and I, I just I can't afford that right now. And so Elsie goes, well, let's pray. So, okay, we pray, and we go, Lord, please offer us the cheapest solution to this problem that we can imagine. Now, at the time, I'm thinking this is a pretty selfish prayer, isn't it? And we finish the prayer, and Elsie goes, if it's your will. <laughs> True story. And I look at her, and I go, you know what, Elsie, you don't have to say if it's your will after every prayer we pray. He, he understands our hearts. He knows where we're coming from. She goes, I know, but I want to. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So Cliff shows up and he says, did you try the fuel reset button? So I find it in the back rear panel above the door, pull the panel off, and I see this beautiful red rubber button. It's kind of fun to touch, texture thing, right? And I, I push it in, and I go and I turn the key to the on position, turn it off, wait a few seconds, and it fires right up. And I thought, huh, well thanks Cliff. And we pull, he pulls the rope off because he was starting to get things ready. And I get my pickup and I say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In the moment, it was such a small, insignificant thing, right? I mean, it, it really did sound, in my mind, I thought, what a selfish prayer. But I also recognized that the Lord answered that prayer exactly how we asked him to. Give him credit with those small prayers when he answers those. Because he wants to provide for you. Because God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Clearly in this moment, his purpose was to provide this easy solution for us. But so often we take that verse out of context or we just cut it off, right? God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him. End. But we forget the according to his purpose part. It's got to be part of his will. Yes, he wants to provide for you. Yes, he wants to give to you so that we can glorify him. But remember, it's got to be part of his will. So if the answer is no, that's still an answer. Keep your eyes open for something better on the horizon. Don't be deceived by these false, false gospels. This name and claim it, that is straight from the evil one. Straight from Satan. And Satan has a word of taking something good when it comes to scripture and he will twist it into something that it's not because he knows that's how he can get us. He plays on our selfish nature to get us to walk away from Christ and to follow him. He did it to Adam and Eve. Oh, surely you won't die as God told you. You'll just be like him. He did it to Jesus in the wilderness. He threw scripture back at Jesus, but Jesus is God. And so he says, huh, I'm not playing that game. Shall not put the Lord your God to the test. 
Don't be deceived by these false, false gospels. This is something that Satan's been doing forever. And Paul knew that. He wrote in 2 Corinthians 11, 14 through 15. He says, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it's not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Those who hold to this prosperity gospel are selfish to the core, and they're setting their sights on worldly treasures, worldly wealth. And Jesus knows that we're prone to idolize wealth. Look at the rich young ruler. He followed the laws. Jesus didn't say, no, you didn't follow the law. He said, okay. Give up your earthly treasure for heavenly treasure. And the ruler says, I can't do that. I love my wealth too much. In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Now, this doesn't mean you can't be wealthy. Some of you might think, oh, I do pretty well financially. It's not the point. Money itself is not evil. God knows that. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Of all sorts of evil, it's idolization, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. It's okay to be wealthy. Don't fall in love with your wealth. Don't idolize your wealth. Don't put your wealth above your responsibilities to God. Be generous with your money. Be generous for the sake of God and for the sake of His kingdom, but put your faith and your love on the riches of God, on the eternal treasures. All of these ideas, all of these false gospels take the idea of Jesus and turn him into man's idea of who and what God should be. But who is Jesus? What will Jesus do for you? There are so many things, as I was preparing for this, I had a hard time narrowing it down. Because there are so many good things. So many good things. We read in verses 29 and 30, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times as much at this time. Jesus understands the sacrifice that is to leave your family, to leave your home, and to follow him. So let's look at some of the things that we're going to receive on this side of heaven at this time. It says, for this reason, this is in Matthew 6, for this reason I say, you do not be worried about your life. Uh-oh. You don't have to show your hands, but how many of you get worried on a daily basis? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh-oh. It says, don't be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor your body as to what you will put on. Is not life, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? How many of you have been to the doctor and say, you're stressing yourself to the point of, you're going to die at some point? That's a real thing. Jesus says, no. You're not going to add any time to your life by worrying. You're going to do the opposite. And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. That's one of the worst things that Jesus could say to you. He says, do not worry then saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles, the earthly people, the people who don't love God, the people who love themselves, the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow. 
for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Did you catch this in there? You are his prized creation. God loves you. You are, of all the things, think of all the beauty that we've seen in this universe. God loves you more than all of that. He loves you so much. He's going to provide for you. Your food, your drink, your clothes, your basic needs, God will meet those if you let him. If you put your faith in him, he will provide for you. Second thing I want to talk about is a guilt-free life. We are all sinners. We are all guilty of sin. And if you think you're not, and there are people out there, ask yourself this. Have you loved God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength for every second of your life? Have you done that? And if you have, ask yourself this. Have you loved every person you've ever met in your life every second with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? I guarantee you the answer to one of those two questions is no. And if the answer is no, congratulations, you're a sinner just like the rest of us. But in him, we have redemption through his blood. Ephesians 1, 7, 8 say, the forgiveness of our trespasses is through his blood, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. You know, we talk about the grace movement and the exploitation that it preys upon, upon God's grace. This isn't that. This is not an exploitation of his grace. But we're all guilty of sin, as we just established. But through, excuse me, through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, through him shedding his blood, we can now live a life free from the guilt and shame of sin. What a wonderful thing. You can, you can lay your guilt down at his feet and say, Jesus, I am a sinner. Please forgive me. He has lavished his grace upon us. When I was down in Colorado Springs, our pastor, Doug Good, he's a senior pastor at Front Range Alliance Church down there, he used to give this illustration for the word lavished. He loved peach pie. And he said, you cannot eat pie without whipped cream. You better lavish on the whipped cream. So he would take the pie. You got this piece of pie. I know it's not here. I should have brought some pie this morning. That would have been, hmm. But he said, and you got the whipped cream, right? You got the, the little spray ball, right? He said, lavish that whipped cream on there. And he'd go, Fingers get tired. You better not be able to see one speck of that peach pie. That's how you eat pie. Brothers and sisters, that's how God lavishes his grace upon you. There's no more sin left to see. He offers you redemption from sin. He offers you a guilt-free life where you can live in confidence with Christ. Does that mean we will never sin again? No. Sanctification is an ongoing process that starts when you become a believer and it's never perfected until you're in eternity with Jesus. But it's real. Living a life free of guilt, a life free of shame, that's a real thing that Jesus offers for you. If you're living with guilt from sin, that comes straight from the pits of hell. That is the evil one trying to undermine the work of Christ. If you're there, talk to somebody. Talk to me, talk to Matt, talk to Phil, talk to an elder. Talk to somebody because if you're living in guilt, you are not experiencing the freedom of Christ that you should be experiencing. 
and you're being, you're being undermined by Satan himself. Find somebody to talk to so that we can help you through that because that is not the freedom that Christ offers. Jesus wants you to live a life free of guilt. And that's a beautiful thing. I know from experience. Third thing I want to talk about, Jesus is salvation. Because we are sinners, we deserve punishment from God. I've already established God is just and he has to punish sinners. But through Jesus, Romans 5, 1 through 2 tell us, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace, which we've talked about, in which we stand and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. That term justified, if I get the opportunity to preach more here, you're going to hear me use it more and more because that's the, the word, the one word that describes the work of the gospel. Justified is a courtroom term. It's a term that means declared righteous. Now notice that it means declared righteous. You can't earn righteousness. You can't attain righteousness by your own means. It's only through the blood of Christ. Think of it like this. Let's say I was headed out to the church here this morning on the highway, and I'm going 65 and 45. I wasn't, okay? But if I were, highway patrolman pulls me over, says, hey, uh, Mr. Eckert, caught you going 65 and 45. Got on my neat little dashboard camera here. And the radar says, like, okay, you got me, I'm guilty. I am guilty of crime. Says, yep, here's your ticket, and I also threw on reckless driving because that's endangering people, and it's a reckless driving ticket. 20 miles an hour over the, over the speed limit. So he gives me this ticket, and he says, show up to court if you want to challenge this. So I show up to court, and I'm guilty. And suddenly, someone else walks up beside me and says, your honor, I have never sped on that road one time in my life. And I'm here because I know he has. So, Your Honor, if you would, would you take his guilt, give it to me, and make me pay that fine, and take my innocence and put it on him so that he doesn't have to pay any penalty for this fine? And so the judge looks at this person and says, That's what you want to do? Okay, Todd. I declare you righteous, you're free to go. And then he punishes the person who took my guilty, my guilt, my guilt. That's how the cross of Christ works. When you put your faith in Christ, Jesus says, I will take the punishment for your sins. I will save this person from the, the penalty of eternal damnation in hell so that they can spend it in righteousness, praising God and glorifying Him for all of eternity. Wow. We were enemies with God. We were sinners. And Jesus said, I'll fix that. I'll take that. Uh, Dwight Brown, another guy down at Front Range Lines Church, wow, I'm pulling out all the big guns today. He said, he likened it to this. The way that Jesus' sacrifice worked is you're a prisoner in an enemy camp. Someone throws a grenade into the middle of the group of enemy soldiers, and it's going to kill all of them. But instead, you, as their prisoner, jump on that grenade and sacrifice your life so that your enemies can live. Whoa. That's what Jesus did for me? That's what Jesus did for you? He died on the cross so that we could have salvation. And along with that, we get peace with God. We are no longer his enemy. We're now adopted into his family. And I heard the adoption went through last week. Did I hear that? Congratulations. Me. Adoption is a wonderful thing. You know, when you're born into a family, you don't get to pick your family members. But when you adopt, you're chosen. God looked at each and every one of you and says, I want you as part of my family. Come be with me. What an incredible, incredible honor that is. What an incredible feeling that is that God chose you to 
be part of his family because we are now at peace with him through the blood of Christ. And when we do fall victim to sin, we are standing in his grace. He says, I see, I hear your plea. Come, rest in my grace. I forgive you. When this happens, when you put your faith in Christ, you're given the Holy Spirit. John 15, verses 26 to 27. Jesus is getting ready to part, and he says, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me, and you will testify also, because you have been with me from the beginning. When you put your faith in Christ, you are now empowered with the Holy Spirit, and you can carry out the will of God. You can overcome sin. You can overcome temptation through the power of His Spirit. And you can also overcome the perils of this life. Because being a Christian doesn't mean life will be easy. I'm sorry. It's not like that. Jesus never promises an easy life. But He promises goodness for you in eternity. But you can overcome those perils. Philippians 4.13. You see it everywhere. You guys quote it, right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Don't forget the context. Pastor Doug used to say, oh, can you? Good, go outside and pick up a car. It's not what Paul's talking about in his letter to the Philippians. Paul, in context, he's talking about, hey, I've learned to live with wealth, and I've learned to live with absolutely nothing. I've, Paul says, I've suffered more than you can imagine, and, and there's a whole reason why he does this, and if you read Philippians, there's some context there. But he says, I've been in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. And if you know anything about that, they couldn't give 40 because they thought if I gave 40 lashes, the Jews did, they'd kill the person. So five times the Jews lashed Paul within one lash of his life. Paul says, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. And if you remember that account in scripture, they only stopped throwing the stones at him because they thought he was dead. He says, three times I was shipwrecked. Man, I thought it was bad to have our car broken down on the side of the road. He says, a night and a day I have spent in the deep. I had to sit on a stone bench for about 15 minutes. That was tough. He says, I've been on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. I have faced a fraction of what Paul has faced. And I'll tell you, I thought my life was pretty tough at times. And it has been. And I'm not trying to undermine anything any of you are going through. You might be struggling with finances. You might be struggling with a relationship. You might be struggling with sin. You might not know what you're going to be doing for a job next week. But you'll make it with the power of Christ, with his help. As Christians, God has empowered us to overcome all of that because he doesn't want us to stay there. That old saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yeah. When you are able to overcome these hardships through the power of Christ, it will grow your faith. It will strengthen your relationship. And we can overcome any obstacle that gets in our way because we have the power of the Holy Spirit. Man, God's design is perfectly for us so that we can live in his joy. Not always easy, but always joyful. And those are just some of the things that we get to experience in this life through the death and resurrection of Christ. What about in the age to come? He says, and in the age to come there, Luke 18.30, we gain eternal life. 
One of my favorite passages in Scripture is Revelation 21. I'm going to turn to it. You can too. I love this, and I've probably preached on this half a dozen times at least already, or at least use this. And I love this because it reminds me that there's so much better on the horizon. Would I love to be here now? Yes. My ankles remind me of the pain I go through on a daily basis. But he says, Revelation 21.3, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Hard to imagine living in the physical presence of God, isn't it? I mean, at times he does seem far away, but no. He's right here now through the Spirit, and eventually we'll get to be among him in his perfect, glorifying presence. I can't wait. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. That includes you and me. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. Can you imagine your life without pain? I think of a friend that we have who has chronic arthritis. There are times when it's agonizing and debilitating. Or how about, how about the person who's struggling with cancer treatment? These bodies are imperfect. But there is a time for those who love Jesus for those who put their faith in Jesus where that will not be an issue any longer. No more crying. No more death. No more mourning. No more pain. No more suffering. Just eternity in the presence of God praising Him and glorifying Him. When you put your faith in Christ all of this can be yours now and into eternity. People will let you down at times. Because we're sinners. Because we're imperfect right now. Even the people you know the best and the people you love the most will let you down. Jesus will never let you down. Because all of his promises, everything that we read today, all of them are yes and amen. Remember that when you're at your best, and certainly do not forget that when you're at your worst. If you're a believer, if you are already there, you already have a relationship with Christ, your faith has made you well, just as Jesus told the blind man. Your faith in him has made you well. I urge you, continue to seek him, continue to strive to live a life that's pleasing to him, because we know what the alternative is. And for those of you who don't know Christ, and I can't see in your hearts, I don't know who that is, put your faith in him and experience a life free of guilt, a life free of shame, a life full of blessings. It's not always going to be easy, that's not what I'm saying. But the blessings far outweigh the hardships. Experience a life where he will never let you down. A life that will continue on into eternity. And so I ask, as the music team comes up, what do you want Jesus to do for you? Let's pray. Father, through your Son, you promise so much to us. And all you ask in return is that we love your son and that we believe in him. Seems so simple at times, but we also know how hard temptation is to overcome, Lord. So I ask that you empower us through your spirit 
to love you more, to believe in you more, to have more faith in you and your promises. Because you want to work for us. You want to make a difference in our lives. You want to be important to us. And Lord, that's how we glorify you. Lord, let us recognize, let us recognize when you are working in our lives. And let us give that glory to you because you are worthy. You are one who deserves it, Lord. I just thank you. Because there will come a day, Lord, when, when we won't have to deal with these issues, with spiritual blindness, with temptation, with idolatry. Lord, what a, glorious set, what a glorious day that will be when we're in your presence, face to face, praising you for all of eternity. Lord, I pray that we stay strong until the end as a body and as believers. We pray this knowing you will, you will grant these prayers, yes, in the name of Jesus. Thanks, Todd. I thought we could close today singing doxology together. So why don't you guys stand with us this morning as we close out? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise recognize your grace in our life this week in your precious holy name amen you guys are dismissed